we will be considering Psalm 15 today. You will find that on page 853 in your pew Bible. <clears throat> it's a psalm I think we are quite familiar with. It's a song that is about Jesus Christ. Because as you read this psalm about who may dwell with God, if verses 2 through 5 describe that person, I'm not eligible. And I don't think any of you are. Psalm 14 of last week described the unregenerate. Psalm 15 describes the regenerate. A Psalm of David. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill. Here's the answer. He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury, that means interest, and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Leave your Bible open for your reference. This has been a wonderful sermon to work on this week in the passing of John because John is in the presence of the Lord at this very moment. Are you? Are you dwelling in the sanctuary of God? Or is that a not yet? It's a tremendous question. It's an urgent question. Because this psalmist, David, knows a whole lot about the sanctuary of God. David knows a tremendous amount about the holy hill. David worshipped at the temple. And in the temple was the holy place where you had the table of showbread the altar of incense and the golden candlesticks. But that's not the sanctuary. The sanctuary in the temple was a curtain. If the wall behind me was that curtain, there was a place behind here which is called the most holy place. That's where God's presence was. Now, God's presence is throughout the whole world, but there was the symbol of God's presence there. In that most holy place, it was a cube, perfect cube, was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant was the testimony. The table of the law, two copies, one for God, one for Israel. 
like when you buy something with your credit card, you get a copy and the merchant keeps a copy. It's a testimony. This is the testimony God gives Israel, his people, because he says, I'm the Lord your God. I have brought you out of Egypt. Since you are redeemed, this is how you will live. When you adopted, I want to call her Jacqueline, but you know, all morning in the prayer, God doesn't reveal that to me. It's Jacqueline, right? When you adopted her, you did expect that she would no longer be completely Chinese. I'm your dad. I'm your mom. You're going to have to adopt English. Not because we're racist. But if you're going to dwell with Duane and Junaine, you're going to have to be compatible. If you're going to dwell with God, God says you're going to have to be living a life that is holy. If you ever lived in the dorm, you prayed for a compatible roommate. You expect fellowship. You expect oneness. You expect communication and fellowship. Not only did you have in that most holy place the Ark of the Covenant, you had the top of that Ark of the Covenant was called the Mercy Seat. And on the mercy seat were two cherubim whose wings touched each other in the middle and whose wings also touched the side of the wall and their faces. Do you know what their faces were doing? The faces of the cherubim, this is God's architecture, God's requirement their faces are to be looking on the mercy seat. And when the temple was dedicated, God fills the temple with smoke. And in the holy place, the most holy place, that's where God's presence remained. Who could go into the sanctuary one man, once a year, for a short visit, the high priest. And God describes the clothing this man has to wear. From his underwear all the way to his outer garments. And if you are not wearing this, God says, you will die when you enter the most holy place. He has to have bells on the hems of his robe. Because... As long as those bells are ringing, he's alive. He needed a rope tied to his ankle. Because if God killed him in the sanctuary, nobody could go in there and get him. He would have to be pulled out. And once a year, he went in to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. David knows that. And so David, in this chapter, verse 1, 
he isn't asking the question, God, who may go in and visit you? That's not the question. The question is much, much more rich. David is asking God, who may dwell with you? Who may make your sanctuary their home? I read to John this week, Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5. One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek. Do you know the rest of that verse? Is it wealth? Is it health? Is it to have a trouble-free life? The request is this, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. You know how long? All the days of my life. Now, John passes away at the age of 85. Is his life finished? No. The saint of God longs to dwell with God all the days of their life. That means here, on earth, you have a taste of the presence of God. Is that true? Is having fellowship with God, is is letting the Word of of the Bible, God's Word, speak to you and you bathe yourself. I use the word marinate yourself. Like that tree in Psalm 1, your roots, they are in the water of the river of God. I firmly believe that was John's experience. John could talk about dying. Didn't change the subject. He was at peace. Because dwelling in the house of God all the days of his life, why would you ever want to do that? What's the benefit of dwelling with God? The psalmist answers it in chapter 27. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. We all realize we are made in God's image. That means there is nothing in this world that we fit in with. We don't. You can only fit in be compatible with, be comfortable with, be at peace with the one you are like. Is that correct? That's why God's people, the saints of God, get along so well because we are all alike. We understand grace, mercy, 
We understand the authority and sovereignty of God. Tomorrow, you're at the service. I'm, I'm preaching on the text that the family gave me. My peace I give you. If you can make that, I really encourage you. That's going to really flush out this. It's a wonderful sermon to preach for, for us all today in this funeral coming up. David understands that God does not lower his standards. We think that, perhaps. The Old Testament God was a lot severer than the New Testament God. Well, God says, I don't change. And when you really read the Old Testament, you don't find a stern God. Well, he's stern to the wicked. You find a God who watches over the way of the righteous. God's people, Israel, are always protected. They're always defended. They're always disciplined. They're always brought back to Him, not because He's such a tyrant, it's because He's such a loving God who wants to dwell with His people. No one can dwell with God unless God is dwelling in them. Would that be correct? The only way you can come to the Father is through Jesus. Jesus says, nobody can come to the Father except through me. And that's what the rest of this psalm is about. He whose walk is blameless. If you're blameless, please stand up. I can be blamed for lots of things. I'm not perfect. David. Is he blameless? <laughs> David's asking the question, and David knows his history. He knows his adultery. He knows his murdering of Uriah. He knows how he's tried to hide sin. He knows how he has trusted his own army rather than God. So, I always love David. Because you think, well, <laughs> at least I never did it that bad. I've hated people, but I've never killed them. I've lusted, but I've never committed adultery. <laughs> you see, God is so wonderful, He doesn't paint over the sin of his people. God holds David. I don't know. Would you like to have your name in the Bible? Would you like to have God publish in the Scriptures that there's a new book here in the Bible and you can call it your name and here's all your sin. And everybody reads it. Generation to generation. David lived about 3,000 years ago. Everybody who's ever read Samuel knows David. Why does God do that? Because God forgives sin. And God is showing you and me, this is the God who forgives you. I forgave David. There's an Apostle Paul you can hold up to. 
Both of them knew their citizenship was in heaven. And so when David asks this question, he knows the answer. I must be blameless. I'm not. I must do what is righteous. I'm not. Who speaks the truth from his heart? David doesn't. Jesus' walk was blameless. Jesus did only what is righteous. And Jesus spoke the truth. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Truly, I say to you. It's Jesus speaking. Verse 3, has no slander on his tongue. There is Jesus who never slandered. When I look at my sin, if Jesus wanted to slander, He could point His finger at me and say, Look, every day of your life, you... Jesus doesn't slander you. He doesn't go around and telling everybody, look at her, look at him. Did you hear about? Somebody told me. I really can't believe this and I don't want to pass it around, but... It... There is no slander on the tongue of Christ who does his neighbor no wrong. Oh, David with Bathsheba. David with Uriah. He's got to know it. Cast no slur on his fellow man who despises a vile man. Despise means doesn't choose to be with. I don't know who you love to be with. I think you love God's people. But in our modern way of communication, you can sit with vile men at your computer very privately and easily. Who honors those who fear the Lord. If you honor those who fear the Lord, you encourage them, you strengthen them, you solidify their leadership, you boys and girls with mom and dad. If you see your mom and dad honor the Lord, and they do, you're going to bless them and encourage them and thank them and say, Thank you for being a godly father and a mother who loves the Lord. Keeps his oath even when it hurts. Did Jesus do that? Jesus came to earth to die. And then you get that little thing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember? Oh God, if you can take this from me. <laughs> Is he turning chicken? Oh, Jesus Christ is going to die and He prays for the resurrection. For the joy set before Him, it hurt Jesus immensely to carry out your and my salvation. Your oath of marriage, your oath to raising children in the fear of the Lord when you had them baptized, if it hurts, you do it. Who lends his money without usury? My goodness, we do that now, don't we? What did the interest is the bank pay you? 0.01% or something? <laughs> this has to do, if there's a needy person and they need a loan, you give them a loan and you don't charge them interest. You don't make money off of somebody else's misery. Doesn't accept a bribe against the innocent. 
He who does these things will never be shaken. Wow. People of God, this does not describe you. This describes Jesus. David knew he could never dwell with God unless there was someone who stood in his place. God doesn't love everybody. Don't get that heresy in your head. There are millions, billions, whom Christ has died for. Abraham, your seed will be like the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. Your desire, your heart, your life, people of God, when it is in the grip of the Spirit and you're having fellowship with God, this is how you desire to live. That's what this is teaching us. Christ brings us into the sanctuary, into the holy hill. May you be blessed richly as you dwell in the sanctuary in the holy hill of God. Amen. Father, what an awesome chapter. What an awesome thing to live with you, the Holy God. May every one of us be blessed with that fellowship, that eternal home. Amen.